I was just telling uh, the audience that uh, you all are having all the rains. We need some of it here. We are all 40 degrees plus <laughs> sweltering. Yeah, here it is. Here it is. Climate is good, but the rain has stretched a bit, especially yeah. with my company working with an institute at full swing. Yeah. Uh, you know, it is. we are fighting against uh, the rains to get the work completed. Hopefully, this is the last of the shower. Yeah, hopefully. They say that before the Diwali, there is one shower. Hmm. Good evening. Hello friends, starting soon an unmissable live coverage here on Sailor Today TV. You're asking what time? Mumbai. Uh, it's a very, very rainy day today here in Mumbai. Uh, it's been raining since morning. The traffic jams everywhere. And uh, uh, I took one and a half hours to travel a distance of uh, what I would usually come in 20 minutes. So with that, let us uh, start the ball rolling. I welcome you all to this uh, uh, webinar. And, and what is unique about this webinar is that uh, we are here sitting in the in our uh, CMMI office in Mumbai, and the speaker is in Dubai. Speaker is not in India. Speaker is from Dubai, and we have uh, uh, I can see now twenty three participants who are uh, all over the place. I can see our master sitting in his uh, in his home. We have Captain Basin who is traveling, uh, Secretary General, and uh, who else is there? Yeah, a lot of you. Uh, Captain uh, Matthews is there. Philip, welcome. Then we have uh, Dr. Bardwaj. Welcome, sir. Uh, Captain. I saw Captain Barve. Yeah, now I can't see. Captain Barve. Yeah, I, yeah, yes. I can, now I can see Captain Barve. Good evening, Barve. Welcome, sir. Good evening, Barve. Our treasurer, Captain Gyanendra Singh. Welcome. And of course, uh, the two speakers, Captain Patnai, Captain uh, Saurabh, uh, who else? Captain Ashok Adwani, welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. So with that, let us let us start our today's uh, uh, meeting, this uh, nice. webinar. Uh, at the outset, uh, please permit me to welcome our master, Captain B.K. Jha. Captain Jha, uh, uh, we'd like to address uh, the members. So it's all yours. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. 
Thank you very much, especially the Mumbai people who have come to the office and I'm watching this live. Well, I have two, three points to talk about it. First point is that Extra Master Pass Part C class will start from the 5th of November. So please advise people, candidates to enjoy themselves. So remember, 5th November. Second part which I wanted to inform for 11th, 11th of February or 18th of February, we will have annual dinner which has been planned. Date is not 15th, but it will be 11th or 18th. So please mark your diary and attend these uh, function. That part we have started the campaign one for one. That's about each member we request to make one member of the company of Mahasamaya. So you are requested to influence Mahasamaya to become a member. So one for one. That's what the is going to be open to you. Now, I won't stop. I won't come in between the evening lecture and you. It's a fantastic program, a fantastic summary of what Captain has written it. So let's all listen to him and understand the thing. Thank you very much. First time, all yours. Uh, sir, may I request that only speaker keep himself, otherwise all others should mute, otherwise there will be a resonance. Yes, yes. I'm sorry, Kastav, could you announce? Yes, sir. Uh, Bankar. Little bit of technical issues. Okay, so welcome back. Uh, now I would request our uh, uh, Chief Executive Officer, Captain Sashi Kumar, to introduce the speakers. Captain Sashi Kumar, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, 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 Captain Pradhan. Thank you very much. Uh, firstly, let me introduce uh, Captain Sarov Patena, and then later on he would be uh, introducing the speaker, the topic, and moderating the session. Captain Sarov Patena started his sea career as a direct entry cadet in 1972 in the erstwhile Jainti shipping. And in November 1981, he was promoted as master to SCI. His first two vessels were, in fact, product tankers, Visheshwaraya and Aurobindo, known to all SCI. And after that, he sailed in foreign flags, where he commanded all sides of ships. He moved ashore in UAE in 2001 and worked as a ship chartering firm, then a ship brokering company, and lastly, a ship owning firm, before he founded his own offshore company, Sea Speed Marine Management in Sharjah in 2006. He had his own fleet of crew boats operating within the Persian Gulf, and he also directly chartered in and operating small bulk carriers in the range of 5,000 to 19,000 dead weight feeder vessel services for various Gulf and Oman port. In 2015, for his own personal reason, he took a step back and till date works as an independent marine consultant for a ship owner in UAE and also engaged in sale and purchase of few clients, both in UAE and overseas. He is the chairman of UAE chapter of CMMI since his inception in 2017. Sir, I welcome you to introduce the speaker, the topic and moderate the session forward and also take over the Q&A session. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Captain Sasi Kumar. 
for that introduction and warm welcome to everybody here, all who are brave the weather and the rain in Bombay. And uh, today we have a very interesting topic. Uh, let me introduce today's speaker, who's a very well known personality. Recording in progress. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Can go ahead, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, today's topic is, like I said, a very interesting topic, and none better to present it than uh, the, the speaker of the day. Uh, kindly allow me to introduce Captain uh, S. R. Patnaik. He actually, Captain Patnaik actually joined a Tata subsidiary company called uh, TM International Logistics in in the early part of 2004, and he was in the Port uh, Operations Division. Subsequently, he moved to their chartering division in Kolkata in the latter part of 2004. He was part of the task force, in fact, created to operate the first bulk carrier, the CMB Talent, in March 2005 under a joint vessel operation with NYK. Captain Patnaik was instrumental in starting third-party ship chartering operations under ISL in the latter part of 2005, and he made it a tremendous success. He was transferred to Dubai to head ISL as general manager in 2006, and subsequently COO in 2008, and then the CEO and director in 2011. He was also a director in TM Harbor Services, which is a subsidiary of uh, ISL and TKM Management Germany a company that was managing tugs in Amra port. Prior to joining TMILL, Captain Patnaik was in the Merchant Navy with a sailing experience of 16 years, out of which eight years were in command. He sailed on various types of ships, bulk carriers, tankers, containers, with multinational crew and with a worldwide sailing pattern. Captain Patnaik is a certified master marina from the LBS College in Mumbai and a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Ship Brokers in London. Captain Patnaik has been an eminent speaker on various international platforms on several occasions and is a very well respected maritime professional both here in UAE and abroad in commercial shipping and leadership roles. He is also a member of the Nautical Institute London, MNI and a member of the Indian Business and Professional Council, Dubai, the IBPC. So with that introduction on to Captain Patnaik, let's move on and actually get to hear his views on the subject of today, which is a snapshot view of dry bulk commodities and shipping. <clears throat> All yours, Captain Patnaik, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Bhatina. Thank you, <clears throat> CMMI, for giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, it's a very interesting subject, very passionate to uh, what I do. And uh, so, so the topic that I've chosen is dry bulk commodities and shipping. So I'll talk about commodities and shipping both. Uh, so before I get into uh, the details, so let me first introduce uh, about myself. I think Captain Patina has already spoken. So ISL was established in Dubai in 2004. Uh, we are into ship owning, ship operating and commercial management, all three aspects. We also owned a towage company a uh, few years back when Tata Steel owned Dhamra port. So, but after Adani took over the port, we had to let go that company to Adani. So that company no more exists. Um, but, but we had the experience of managing tugs those days. And I was that company was owned partly by us and one of our sister companies in Germany. Uh, so in ISL, we, we sort of chartered it in a year, about 250 odd ships in a year. And we own two ships now. And there are plans to own more ships. So that's about uh, ISL. It's a Tata subsidiary uh, owned 51% by Tata Steel. So getting into my topics, I'll start with uh, the global dry bulk trade overview. That is, I'll focus on supply demand. I'll not debate uh, much into other aspects of uh, what affects the dry bulk market. Then I'll talk a little bit on market outlook. Then followed by Indian dry bulk trade, Exim as well as Coastal. Then I'll conclude my remarks. So before I get into, let me show you this slide. People who are familiar with rival shipping, they would know what this slide is all about. 
So this is uh, the dry bulb BDI for the last 16 years. And if you see, a uh, few things that come out very clearly is that the dry bulk shipping is highly volatile, cyclical, very sensitive to events. If you see 2008, the markets were at all time high. We have not reached those markets yet. Uh, the BDI touched almost 12,000 points. Cape size vessel uh, was uh, going at $200,000 a day charter hair. The Panamax is going at $160,000 charter hair those days. Then there is a sudden crash when we had your, your global recession in 2008. Then there has been ups and downs. We had a uh, big recession again in 2016. Then the pandemic in 2000, uh, 2020. And now we are heading almost into another recession in 2023. So, so if you see that it's been, it's been, sorry, it's been, uh, it's been a highly volatile market, and and the volatility has increased over the years. In the last say 15 years, the volatility has increased because of multiple reasons. The size of ships have increased, and also there is another element of getting into the derivative market. A lot of ship owners and traders are getting into derivative market. That is FFAs. So that also partly controls your physical market. And that also leads to a lot of volatility in the market. So with this note, let me just sort of take you to the, uh, the main core issue of supply demand. So on the demand side, if you see the global sea bond dry bulk volume is 5.5 billion tons, out of which the major bulk that constitutes your coal, iron ore and grain, that's about 3.3 billion tons, that's 60%. And your minor bulk, is 2.2 billion tons. There are your bauxite, steel, fertilizer, agri products, so on and so, so forth. So, so these are the commodities that that sort of uh, uh, the, these are these are which are which moves uh, globally and and they they control the the demand and the demand if the factors affecting demand are your flow of cargo that is ton mile. So that is basically your cargo volume that is moved over a distance. <clears throat> to give an example, if now, India has banned iron ore exports and they've imposed a duty. Now, China has to import this uh, iron ore from Brazil, for example. So, the ton mile is going to increase because the distance from India to China and the distance from Brazil to China is at least, uh, it, it is more by 40, 50 days. So, so many deadweight tonnage gets blocked when the entire volume shifts from India to, to China. India exports about 60 million tons of iron ore. So if 60 million tons of iron ore has to be imported from Brazil, so that much of extra tonnage gets blocked and that sort of takes the demand up. Then you have got your economic indicators, your GDP growth of your major economies like USA, China, India. Then the credit growth, uh, if you see the credit growth has got a huge correlation with your uh, dry bulk market. I'll show, let me show you this slide. So, so currently the credit growth uh, of China is on the rise, but it has got a very high correlation with your BDI. Uh, so in 2022 end, that is, we expect the, the um, China's credit growth to be to be tipping down and it's going to increase in 2023. So we expect the market to be quite pretty down end of 2022 and, and chances will recovery in 2023. Then you have got uh, then your geopolitical situation that also affects your dry bulk market. Now, if you see here, they can be your war between Ukraine and Russia, which is currently going on. You had a spat between Australia and China a few months back so that your trade between Australia and China also got impacted. Iran sanction is still in place. You had uh, issues like drought in South America and Europe, the yellow, yellow uh, shaded countries. Uh, piracy in Arabian Sea and West Africa. So all these factors also play a role in your demand. So when you have any kind of incident uh, that takes place, then your uh, your cargo volume shift and that affects your demand. Then world steel production that also has a huge correlation with your dry bulk market. You can see here, this is your steel production vis-a-vis -vis your growth rate and BDI. That is a huge correlation. And uh, your congestion. So congestion in various ports, especially you see here, this is a flow chart of ships that are moving all over, all dry cargo ships. 
you have congestion in south america during grain season you have congestion in indian ports during peak import seasons of fertilizer and coal in, then you have got congestion in china so all this also play a huge role in your you know demand side then the derivative market so that this is the trade that i was talking about that's growing up and it is picking up in a big way the traded volume is about 1 million tons now ffs and on your options is about 162000 uh, so that so that is also growing so that was not there pre 2010 so it has picked up momentum in 2015 onwards so this too also plays a huge role then people when commodity traders and ship owners take a position on the ffa market that impacts your uh, your, your demand side <clears throat> so coming to supply so the trading fleet is about 950 million deadweight or 13000 odd trips there are more than 10000 deadweight and 16% of trading units are ships of poc uh, that is very large over carrier 28% are panamax post panamaxes 33% supramaxes and 22% are handy sizes so the top uh, five fleet ownership rests with china that is 19% 18% with Greece, Greek owners, 15% Japanese owners, 5% Hong Kong. So that and rest are very very fragmented. The average age of global fleet is about 11 years now. It's all about dry bulk, and the average demolition age is 25 years. About 1500 odd ships are more than 20 years, and they are highest in handy and Panamax segment. So we expect about 700 odd ships to be scrapped in next five years. So that is a healthy uh, healthy sign, and we should expect the market to improve. when these ships they go away and since your order book which i'll come to it later is all time low at 6.8% now so you should see a healthy market from end of 2023 onwards although we expect the market to be pretty down in 2023 so factors affecting supply again are order book as i said so that is the number of ships that are on order uh, in the yards various yards so for last two years during pandemic post pandemic most of the yards are full with container ships so now those yards are slowly getting eased off and the ships are already out i think now they are taking new orders on bulk carriers and other uh, types of ships so but still the order book is pretty low and another factor that is affecting your order book is your new regulations on carbon emission that are coming into force from 1st january 2023 on eexi cii so that also is holding back many prospective owners to order new new ships as they are not they are not very sure as to what kind of propulsion system they should have in the ship so that is also one of the reasons why the order book is very low but that is helping the market and the market should remain pretty healthy if the economic situation gets better uh then also it depends on deliveries so you could have order books but if the deliveries are not in time then then you have less number of ships on water and that also leads to your uh, supply side uh, stress then congestion if more ships are blocked as i told you in my earlier slide that also affect the supply side overage scrapping uh when the generally typically have seen in the market goes down you have more scrapping the market moves up the scrapping reduces and uh, certain trades they accept old tonnages especially your indian coastal trade chinese coastal trade they can take the ships age up to 30 years whereas trades like uh, grain or fertilizer or even coal from australia india they don't accept ships more than 15 years or 18 years so you tend to sort of scrap ships anywhere between 20 to 25 years uh, so so that that also affects your supply side scrap price scrap price again is highly volatile beginning of this year the scrap price is 700 dollars per ldt now the scrap price is 600 dollars per ldt it went down almost to 400 dollars ldt in summer of 2020 so so this also affects so ship owners wait for a good market for them to recover their uh, asset value so when they see the market is good the scrap price is up then they try to scrap the ships and for a better earning also new regulations so as i said just now exi cii the new rules you also had your ballast water treatment system plant to be fitted then you had your scrubber in 2020 in 2020 so all these new regulations also play an part important role uh, in on a supply side uh, uh, and and that also impacts your supply side <clears throat> so on the commodity flow if you see uh, iron ore trade as the three major bulks as i said iron ore coal and grain so these are the major trade flows for iron ore and the major exporting countries are brazil south africa and australia uh, so 1.55 billion tons of iron ore is moved 
from the total 5.5 billion dollars as i said and they are mostly carried on capes and panamaxes and the trade is restricted mostly to brazil china australia china so that this is almost 65% of the trade and uh, and vale is the is the uh, largest exporter of iron ore from brazil on the coal they comprise primarily of thermal coal which is for power plants and coking coal, coal for steel making and that's about 1.17 million uh, billion uh, tons uh, 78% is thermal coal 22% is coking coal india imports about 60 million tons of coking coal and about 140 million tons of thermal coal china is the biggest importer of largest importer of uh, thermal coal uh, so the thermal coal imports have come down and the prices have been fluctuating quite a lot the prices touched almost 450 dollars for thermal coal and the prices were hovering around 100 dollars per ton say year back it went up to 400 dollars per ton right now they're settling around 270 dollars per ton so that also plays a big role on uh, on your uh, on your trade australia exports about 400 360 million tons indonesia 322 million tons followed by russia 177 million tons the current sanctions of russian coal Uh, is also having uh, uh, is playing a big uh, role in the trade now and the price so uh, so although it is not sanctioned but uh, many traders are apprehensive to move russian coal because uh, uh, not many owners are very keen to move russian coal because primarily because of not getting insurance pni insurance for uh, moving coal from russia so that's that's the challenge uh, which is being dealt with now coming to grain so grain you have got basically three types of grain wheat coarse grain and soybean meal uh, so wheat is about 150 million tons of wheat that is traded worldwide followed by coarse grain which is about 180 million tons and soybean is about 200 million tons so that again the major exporting countries are brazil argentina australia and usa canada and they move all over but the trade between brazil argentina and china is the most uh, active trade uh so so argentina exports about 41 million tons of grain uh, brazil exports about 27 million tons so that that itself is a big quantity followed by canada and usa this is mostly done on panamaxes again not on cape uh, as against iron ore which is done on capes and panamaxes and for short haul businesses inter black sea or europe to uh, west africa or uh, egypt or middle east they are all done on supramaxes but mostly the long haul business is done on panamaxes so i'll now come to the market outlook now uh, so the gdp for most economies are likely to contract by 3% in 2023 except southeast asian countries middle eastern countries where the economies are likely to do good but most other economies are contracting so that's not a very very good uh, sign and it's a, it's a matter of concern for the industry the crude steel production also is going down and is likely to go down next year uh, the price hr coil price i was told is being traded at 600 dollars per ton it was being traded at 1200 to 1500 dollars per ton say about 5 months back so it's almost slashed by 50% <clears throat> so we expect the demand ton mile to remain almost flat next year and the supply side to remain around 1.5 to 1.8% next year so and could touch 2% depending upon the number of ships that are delivered uh, so with that we don't expect a very good market in 2023 we already started seeing signs of market slashing the markets were about $40000 for example for a panamax end of 2021 early 2022 but they have already come down to 14 15000 now same for handy size and supermaxes Uh, i don't see the markets going down below 10000 dollars but it's definitely not going to go more than 25000 dollars so we should see the rates hovering between 10 to 25000 dollars for for the coming months and for most part of 2023 uh so on the new regulations on gag emission that should sort of see most of the older ships to reduce uh, their speed to comply with exi even i have seen few new vessels are not complying with the exi Uh, if that happens then few ships have to slow speed to meet the requirement if they are really in a bad shape they they'll have to be scrapped so i expect about 10 to 15% of the fleet uh, will not be complying with the exi requirement and they'll have to slow, slow speed and maybe 3 to 5% will be uh, will have to be scrapped 
uh, I'll skip this one. Like, uh, then I'll go to the Indian rival trade. So coming up to Indian rival trade, India, as you know, is a is a country which with 3.1 trillion dollar economy, 1.4 billion population, and uh, poised to become a five trillion dollar economy by 2027, as uh, the government is uh, pushing very hard to reach that target. Blessed with a very long coastline of 5,560 kilometers and 14,500 kilometers of inland waterways or navigable waterways, as they call it. 12 major ports, 200 minor ports, out of which 40, 50 minor ports are very active. Uh, maritime transport plays a very important role in India's economy as 95% of country's international trade is, 95% uh, uh, of the maritime transport, 95% uh, uh, of the international trade is through maritime transport by volume and 65% by value. And the total cargo handled in 21-22 in the 12 major ports uh, is about 720 million tons. And in the non-major ports, which are private ports and also your state government ports, that's about 600 million tons. The share of traffic of non-major ports is about 45% and major ports is 55%, out of which the share of dry cargo is 40%. So this can show you the, the division between your major and minor ports. Uh, and uh, in the major ports, the dry, dry cargo is about 40%, liquid cargo is 30%, and container is 23%. Of the 40% dry bulk, iron ore is 7%, coal is 20%, which is highest, as I told, 140 million tons of coal is imported, and coastal moment is another about 30 million tons. Fertilizer is 2.2%, other cargo is about 11.8-12%. If you see the Indian map, then the northern ports, that is north of Isaac in the eastern side and north of Mumbai on the western side. So they are very active in import and export both, but the southern ports are more importing ports. Uh, so the export cargoes are primarily, if you see, are iron ore, which is about 37 million tons. It was 60 million yeah. tons before the, uh, so before two years, but they have come down to 37. Right now, this year we expect, because of the uh, export duty, it will be about 20 million tons, primarily pellets. Steel is about 13 million tons, sugar about 8.6 million tons, wheat about 7 million tons. Again, you, as you know, uh, rice uh, export has been banned because of uh, India wants to uh, conserve your rice. Only I think basmati rice is allowed to export. Non-basmati rice is not allowed to be exported. On the import side, thermal coal is 140 million tons, cooking coal is 60 million tons, fertilizer 20 million tons, limestone 19 for primarily for steel and cement industry, pet coke 4.9 and cement. These are the major cargoes which are imported and exported. So coming to coastal shipping. <clears throat> so coastal shipping, it accounts for six to six to seven percent of the total domestic freight on a ton kilometer basis. That's again very low compared to major economies like US and China, even Europe, where coastal shipping is about 15%. So I think India's target is to get the coastal shipping up by uh, to at least reach 25% because ultimately, if you know, uh, the, the economy is like this up to 400 kilometers road transport is the most economical mode of transportation, 400 to 1200 kilometers it is railways and more than 1200 kilometers it is uh, shipping route or the sea route. Um, and also the road transport which is which accounts for the highest that is about 55% uh, causes a lot of pollution and from the carbon emission point of view it is not desirable to have the highest share with road transport. So from both, from the economic point of view and from the environment point of view, both point of view, I think it is important to get the sea transportation or coastal shipping up and get your road transportation down. So government, as I said, is targeting to get it up by 25%, but I don't see it come, it reaching that. It will at least reach about 15%, I guess, by 2025 to 2027. The major cargoes again handled by uh, the coastal cargoes handled in major ports is about 170 million tons. That's about 24%. And in non-major ports is 90 million tons. The major share is again with POL, coal, and iron ore. That's about 90% of the total overall coastal movement. <clears throat> uh, and if you see, uh, um, the cost per ton kilometer of a moving cargo by coastal route is much cheaper. It, it's almost 60 to 80 percent below your, your uh, rail and or road transportation cost. 
So these are some of the major cargoes that are moved on the Indian coast. Coal about 29 million tons. This is primarily moved from east to east, that is from Paradeep or Vizag to south southern ports like Krishna Patnam and uh, Tutikorin. Iron ore cargo is moved, that's 24 million tons, primarily from east to west, that is Paradeep, Vizag to Mumbai. And uh, salt is again from west to east, about a million ton. Cement is primarily again west to east, and some part of it moves from west to east also, sorry, west to west. That's 2 million tons. Then other cargoes are pet coke, soda ash, limestone, silica, bauxite, bentonite. <clears throat> so port-wise, if you see, Paradip handles the highest in the major ports, 30 million tons of coastal cargo, and uh, followed by Mumbai and Vishakhapatnam. So coming to my uh, closing remarks, uh, as I said, dry bulk market is highly volatile, and China is the main driver of demand. There's a high correlation between steel production, China's credit growth, and industrial production. So we expect the economy to slow down uh, the coming year, that is uh, 2023. So that should, uh, we should, we should see a uh, market uh, which is uh, sluggish in uh, 2023. And we expect the market to pick up in 2024. There's a huge opportunity in coastal shipping and inland water waterways, especially in NW1 and NW2 where government is uh, trying to divert a lot of cargoes which are moving into Bangladesh and Northeast India through uh, Indo-Bangladesh protocol. So, so the, uh, we see a huge opportunity there, plus the new policies by government, the Sagar Mala and Gati Shakti, that is going to bring in a lot of opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Captain Patnaik. Thank you very Would much. I would like to throw the floor open for question answers. Captain Pantayak, I just wanted to let you know, rice export is being allowed with the normal rice, 5 to 20% broken in it. But broken rice is not allowed. Rice uh, export with 20% duty is allowed. And wheat export has been banned in India. Okay. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Captain Parnaik. This was an excellent uh, presentation. I'm sure uh, lots of information has uh, passed on to all of, all of us. And uh, we're ready to take questions. If anybody has, let's ask Captain Parnaik questions. Let's open it. In fact, if nobody has something to ask, uh, Kevin Padnaik, I would like to just put in a point here. Captain I know Bhardwaj. Captain Bhardwaj's hand is raised up, sir. Ah, okay. Captain Bhardwaj, please go ahead. So, thank you so much. Uh, I, I just to inform the gathering that uh, I met uh, Captain Patnaik very recently at the logistics conference in Chennai. And there's some very interesting information I want to share. Captain Patnaik has been one of the major advisors to the gift city uh, in Gujarat. And there is a very, very interesting proposal for ship owning and ship operators in India. And uh, uh, huge advantages, huge advantages coming up for ship owning if your office is based out of gift cities are. And uh, FEMA does not apply in this zone. 10-year tax holiday is there, no GST, no stamp duty, no capital gains on sale purchase, no IGST of Indian flag vessels, no withholding tax on remittance of hire. And, and, and uh, 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 still there was a there was big issue with respect to the stringent regulatory requirements with respect to Indian flag. So, so believe it or not, no compulsion to fly Indian flag. Foreign flags through subsidiary routes as been currently practiced are allowed. So, Captain Patnaik, sir, <laughs> how do you see this taking off? No, I think uh, Captain Bharadwaj, uh, honestly, it's a very good initiative by the government, no doubt. <clears throat> but you have to always compare this with the international market. And, and all of you know uh, that there are challenges with flagging ships in India. There are challenges uh, 
uh, with the regulatory restrictions, the taxations. I think uh, government, uh, it's, it's a step in the right direction, no doubt. But I think a lot needs to be done to benchmark what is happening in international field. That's very important. Uh, so if you see, I'll tell you that a very simple example, the flag comes to your office to register your ship, whereas you have to run 20 times to DG shipping to flag your ship. So that's the big difference. Liberia flag, uh, which is there in Dubai, Panama flag, Marshall Island, they will come to your office, do all the documentation, hand over the registry certificate in your office here. Imagine some, same as to done in India, how difficult. If any, any ship owners are there in this panel, they would know it is so difficult. Tax, you're dealing with GST on bunkers. You're dealing with GST on, uh, now they have already said that export cargoes, you have, to, you have to pay GST by ship owners. Okay. So, so, it's, so taxation is a very complex angle again. So now gift city, um, you rightly said, I have advised them, uh, but you'll have to see how they maneuver through these complexities. You have got commerce ministry trying to sort of impose uh, their way. You have got uh, your finance ministry, they are trying to impose their way. So gift city has to maneuver. And, and you have, of course, the statutory body like DG shipping, you have to deal with them. So all these three bodies have to be managed to come with something which is very, very uh, customer friendly or trade friendly. So we'll have to see, but it's, it's a step in the right direction. Things are moving in the right, at least it has started. Mm. It is not nothing. I was must, I must share with you that CMI had taken the initiatives to call one of the, some of the best flags in the world with the maximum amount of tonnage. We, 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 we were able to call uh, uh, the UK flag, we were able to call Hong Kong, we were able to call Singapore, even USA for that matter, uh, on how do they go about, um, you know, having a, a, a big fleet and at the same time, very high standards. <laughs> and and uh, there were a lot of takeaways from there. I hope the message goes back. <laughs> today, today there was a, uh, I, I missed that because I had a meeting. Uh, I missed that uh, there is a, a bit, uh, sort of discussion on that in the morning. I, I could not attend that. Yes, but at least uh, the lot of good steps are being taken, and I'm sure uh, it'll it'll uh, at least we are we are we are traversing the right direction. That's that's very important. Thank you. Thank you. So if I, may ask... Sir, I would like, uh, good evening, I am Captain Matthews. I would like to say that even the Indian flag, now it doesn't take, uh, as said, 20 visits to MMD to, to have the change of flag because we have been of recent, uh, I'm talking from behalf of Seven I mean, so I'm working for Seven Island Shipping. We have been able to do change of flag from any flag for within two days, unless, uh, two, uh, two to three days, unless it is, uh, you know, like uh, ship acquired under some sheriff's order, uh, arrested vessel or something, which of course, because of certification issues, take some time. Otherwise, yes, it could be much better. It should be a matter of within a few hours, but then it has improved from some time back, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, but yes, I'm just saying that that a lot of improvement is required to make it more customer friendly. That's what I was, I was trying to hint at. Can you hear me, sir? Yes. Yes. Okay, Captain Patnai, coming back to the topic of driver, like you being as a charter, new CI regulations coming in, how do you foresee, sir? the carbon credits and the use of it as an organization. I mean, uh, what do you think benefit of it or uh, how do you deal with it, the charter? No, first of all, it is it is a it is a directive by the IMO. So all, all ships have to comply. From 1st January 2020, you have to comply because IMO has a very strict guideline for 20, 2030 and 2050 guidelines have to be met. So whether you like it or not, from 1st January 2023, you have to comply with the regulations. So for EXI, as I said, whether it's chartering or owning, we have to, when we charter a ship, you have to ask the owner, have they done the measurement for EXI? And class does a measurement. They will take all the details. And as you know, it is, it is more to be design than performance. CII is performance-based, whereas EXI is design-based. So every ship has to measure their EXI and compare it with your <laughs> acceptable limit. If it is under your acceptable limit, then you are required, you can trade, failing which you cannot trade. So whether it is our own ship, we have already done measurement for our own ship, both the ships are complying. 
and although they're old ships, they're still complying. So that means they're, they're quite good design wise. And CII, you have to sort of have a proper effective plan. You have to measure it depending upon what distance you sail, what fuel you use, and how many days of port stay you have, how many days of sailing days you have. So that's a, it's a very complex calculation and each ship has to maintain that and uh, produce it to the authorities when they ask for. So these two have to be complied with uh, starting 1st January 2023. Thank you. So, uh, Captain Patnaik, you mean to say, uh, henceforth in the coming year, uh, when you are negotiating a charter party, uh, this would have to be seriously taken into account during the negotiations? Yes, we have already started doing that. We already so, started doing that. so, what does one demand uh, from, if you are a charter, do you demand to see the XI uh, performance, the CII log sheets? How do you how do you go about satisfying yourself? Yes, we ask for both of them. Okay. Like major charters, uh, like BHP Billiton, Tata Steel, or uh, uh, or Mittals, they are, they've already started asking you uh, because they have signed up for your C charter agreement where all these things are already there. So it's a, okay. it's a, it's a massive checklist. You have to follow that. So ship owners will have to fill up all that and produce it before the ship can be fixed on charter. Okay, thank you. So you are from Tata Steel. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I, re I understand that this methanol ships which are now coming into the market, uh, the suppliers of methanol are all Tata, uh, are steel products producers. Tata Steel, JSW, they are recycling their carbon dioxide and going for methanol production. And recently, I believe there was this conference in Singapore, and most of these JSW and Tata Steel now landed up there, <laughs> which is uh, Tata Steel is Tata Steel is you know being uh, you know a company which which uh, likes to sort of be ahead of uh, what the world does. So they are they are very much on top of it. I think they have already set a uh, target for themselves to reach uh, carbon zero by. Uh, certain date. So I think they're working very fast on that direction. Uh, and uh, for even for the chartering of ships and in the plant, both. So they have a lot of steps are taken on a war footing basis to see that we comply. And I was there in, uh, just to sort of tell the audience, I was there doing a course on sustainability in Luzon in uh, Switzerland, uh, in IMD. And uh, you'll be surprised to see the kind of, uh, how, how much ahead there from all of us when it comes to sustainability. So it's, it's, it's taken in a, they have all taken it very, very personal. And they all feel that as Europeans, they are instrumental in destroying the world. And they should take the lead in rectifying the defect. So it, it is, they're so passionate about it. And, and, and the banks have stopped lending to companies who are not having a, having a clear uh, guideline on carbon reduction, uh, emission reduction. So they have, they have stopped lending. Uh, so same with uh, uh, no insurance companies. So you have big difficulty when it uh, next year words, your p and insurance, your Holland machinery and underwriters, they are not going to insure you if you do not have a defined roadmap, how you have to reach your, uh, your uh, targets for 2030 and 2050. So you have to, you have to exhibit that for you to be insured. So, so rules are becoming stricter and stricter and it is no more uh, that you can do away with it or get away with it. You have to follow it. And if you have to really be trading internationally, well, government of India or Chinese government could have their own kind of slight deviations from the rules uh, to delay it, but then uh, they'll, they'll have to catch on to it quite fast subsequently. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, on one, one side, we talk about the, this, the push for sustainability in Europe and uh, they want to get away from the Older. Yeah, they, they want to get away from the hold of, you know, they stopped importing coal a long time ago. They're trying to be self-sufficient with their gas and the other means of, uh, you know, uh, production methods. But now with the war in progress and with a couple of accidents on the North Stream line, for example, I'm seeing a lot of demand, a lot of orders are being placed for coal, again, from Indonesia to to Poland, to Germany, from Colombia, a lot of coal going to uh, Poland and Germany. So uh, isn't this something that is against their principles? It is, it is, but I think uh, they are more LPG, your uh, 
natural gas dependent than coal dependent but then since suddenly there is a problem and you're not getting enough gas from russia and they had to take a political decision not to uh, import gas and you don't really get this uh, gas immediately from elsewhere and your major next major exporter is qatar that takes a bit yeah. of a time because they're all the requirements are all uh, sort of you know lined up and they have, they have uh, signed up on long term contracts with various countries it's not so easily available next is usa again it's difficult to get it from there so i think it's a stop gap arrangement to import coal and use it for some time because now we are getting into winter where they have to again yeah exactly meet meet the winter requirements and this is uh, i don't but in the long term they are very very clear that they have to be uh, going for cleaner energy not uh, not coal based uh, or fossil fuels so they are very very clear about it Any other question? Nobody else has anything to ask. Where is my I think, yeah. Well, let's see how this goes with the with the coal movements all over. And uh, on the Indian Coastal Service, uh, how is that doing at the moment? In so, Indian Coast, as I said, about uh, 30 million tons of thermal coal moves on the coastline. That is from Paradi, primarily Paradi. Paradi exports about 50 million tons of coal. And that is going to continue because uh, that's, that's, uh, how do I say, that's a lifeline for our country because you have to, you have to meet the power requirement of so many people. 1.4 billion population is not a... Uh, you know, a small population to deal with. I think government of India, although they want to reduce and and become uh, carbon zero by a certain date, but then uh, it has to uh, coal dependence. I don't see coming down uh, so quickly. Uh, so coal movement will continue, and uh, uh, your uh, major exporter is of course in the belt, Mahanadi coal fields, and that belt in Orissa and Bihar border. So that's where the major coal is coming from, and the major users are the southern. Uh, states like uh, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, these two, two states. And we are we are one of the uh, uh, major players in the Indian coast. We move about 5 million tons of coal on the Indian coast from Paradip to Krishna Patna, Man to Tikorin. Right. Yes. Otherwise, uh, go back to any further questions? Uh, sir, uh, I, I can have one. <laughs> Though I am more from a tanker background and more from safety. When you are saying so much coal is transferred, what are the major hazards related to coal transfer, sir? No, sir, I think Indian coal, again, the usual, there is... Uh, uh, inflammable coal and you have to take care of your temperature while during transit but since they are very uh, short transit two days transit so you don't have any difficulties as such highly corrosive indian coal is very corrosive high content of uh, ash and sulfur so that causes the corrosion and of course uh, uh, the you have to take care of your temperature otherwise there's no other issues indian coastal coal right and uh, is it like the sticky type or it's 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 dryish easy to wash out it, it is dry it is dry and uh, like are you using in your uh, business uh, do you all use scrubber fitted vessels do you prefer using scrubber fitted vessels for your business no, uh, because LSF is available in most ports now and they're very, very competitive price-wise. Uh, so, as you know, uh, ballast water treatment system uh, was not so uh, popular uh, when the prices went down. Right now, the prices again come back to $700 per ton IFO, so where I think the gap has increased between uh, your high sulfur and low sulfur field, about $200 per ton, uh, $250. So, I think... Uh, but ship owners have realized for that kind of capex investment, it doesn't make sense to uh, go for because uh, when you have low sulfur available everywhere. Are you are you saying that uh, owners who have fitted uh, scrubber fitted vessels are sort of taking a second look at it? 
I think uh, big owners they went uh, for 20% of the fleet to go for scrubber and 80% they left it for low sulfur fuel to be procured outside. So I think uh, they have, I think there are uh, not many owners who are going for uh, BWTs now. So that sort of is stopped now. There was stopped, some not, not, not BWTs. So you mean scrubber? scrubber. Yeah. Scrubber. There was some uh, discussions or there was some talk that certain ports are even prohibiting, for example, open loop fitted uh, scrubber vessels from uh, coming into the port. Yeah. So you know, but, no, they're saying you don't use the scrubber. So you can have the scrubber open loop. Yeah. Uh, closed loop is always acceptable. Open loop, you can have it, but don't use it in the port. You have to use your low sulfur fuel. So again, there is there is a problem there. If you do not have low sulfur fuel, you have only high sulfur fuel, you're not allowed to use your open loop scrubber, then you're again back to square one. Exactly. Uh, your closed loop scrubber is very expensive. Open loop is cheaper. Uh, so many owners went for loop, open loop, but then now they're stuck. Uh, so then as charter, we have to ensure that we, we supply low sulfur fuel the last bunkering ports that we don't have difficult like Indian certain ports they restrict you from using uh, uh, open loop scrubbers. Even Middle Eastern ports also they uh, they they don't allow you to use. But it's a, you cannot just dispose it at sea. You right. have to be careful. And are charters giving a benefit to charters? Are owners giving the benefit of scrubbers to the charters? Yeah, so you pay higher charter hire for that if you have to use the scrubber okay. by at least two thousand dollars. Because today is the Ultramax bulk carriers are, I believe, the best positioned vessel in terms of consumptions, speed and consumption, compared to the. Yeah, they are older, most economical. Yeah, they most economical. They are generally twelve point five at uh, economical is 18, 19 tons per day, so they are very very economical. Yes. Anybody else? Uh, platform is still open. If anybody has any questions, comments. And thank you very much, Captain Watnaik. It was extremely nice of you to give us this uh, area of knowledge with us. Captain Sasi Kumar, would you like to come in? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Watnaik, sir. Thank you. It was an excellent presentation of yours. And thank you very much, Saurabh, sir, for stepping in. <laughs> uh, uh, if, there is, uh, if there are no questions from uh, the audience, I would now request uh, Captain uh, Yanandra Singh to the vote of thanks. Yanandra Singh, please come in, sir. Uh, one query, Captain Trish. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Uh, Captain Trish Kumar, what is Captain uh, Patnaik's opinion of uh, timing now bulk carriers onto the Indian coast? Patnaik, sir? Would like to take the question? Where is Captain oh. Patnaik? Uh, Captain Patnaik, sir? I feel he's he on to... mute. No, he's there. He's there. Uh, I asked to unmute. Uh, Captain Patnaik, uh, there's a question for you. You are on. Uh, can you unmute yourself? Video and audio both are off. Yeah. Maybe some urgent call or something. Captain Cheshi Kumar, it's okay. But later on, I'll take one is to one. <laughs> yeah. So with the with this uh, question answers, there are not many questions. I would like to acknowledge the presence of Captain Barwe, our senior most. Stalwart, who is here with us. Welcome, sir. And uh, one more thing I came to know that Captain Philip Matthews was the cadet sailing with uh, Captain Batena. So, <laughs> Philip, welcome to this uh, meeting. Uh, over to you, Captain Sashi Kumar. Uh, you can propose a word of thanks. Uh, sir, I invite uh, uh, Captain Ganada Singh to propose a word of thanks. Come in, sir. Right, sir. Thank you for that. It's my honor to propose the word of thanks. And uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, though the videos are off from the names, I don't think if we have a lady attending here, but most probably on the YouTube streaming, we may have few. 
So uh, respected master, all the office bearers, wardens, and uh, all participants, uh, I think uh, we had a very great learning. And after usual, after most of the webinars, as we feel that had we more time with a kind of crisp information given by Captain Patnaik, uh, we could have been we could have elaborated more and learned more out of it. But this was definitely very enlightening with a lot of data. Uh, with those uh, uh, scope of activities of future and CII and e EXI explanation about the amount of coal that is being shifted, uh, sh being uh, moved not only uh, out of India, but also on coastal uh, uh, voyages. I would really thank uh, Captain Patnaik for sparing his time and uh, educating people like me and updating others who already knew quite a bit. So thank you so much, sir, for being here and uh, uh, sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, a huge thanks to Captain uh, Bathera, sir, for he is the chairman of our Dubai chapter. For those who, uh, those of you who may not be aware, uh, thank you for arranging all this, sir. Uh, in the sense that you got this together, you got the topic, the speaker, and moderated it. Uh, it would not have been possible without you. Uh, thanks to the master who has uh, always been so encouraging and leading from the front to get such things organized. Uh, Deputy Master Captain Pradhan, uh, Secretary General Captain Bhaseen, uh, ever energetic and always pushing to do more. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I special thanks to all the media, you know, very important today's date. I have a list. So let me read it out. Uh, we have Marex, uh, C Jobs. Bandarkar Publications, Shipping News, Sailor Today, Sagar Sandesh, uh, Maritime Destination, and obviously uh, there would be more. We can't really list out. Nowadays, we have quite a few. And thanks to them for uh, propagating whatever we are doing good. And this information can be shared with more and more people. Oh. Special thanks to Sailor Today, Captain Nangia, for the live YouTube streaming of uh, this webinar. Uh, hybrid mode, you know the best possible in today's date we have learned. So from far off places, we can not only attend, but also uh, speak like we had today, the speaker from Dubai. And uh, over and above, thanks to all the participants, I would really give a special mention. Uh, we had over 40 odd participants here on the Zoom and much more on YouTube. We don't know the exact number there. With special mention of the presence of Captain Barve, Captain Treshriwala, and thanks to Captain Bhardwaj, Captain P.P. Singh, Captain Philip, and all those who made it more interactive. Thanks so much, sir. Uh, special thanks to our CEO. You know, the overall arrangements, everything is taken care of by him with uh, an uh, able support from uh, our office uh, staff, uh, Mr. Sudhir Palkar. So uh, thank you to all of you for being here and making this a great success. Thanks so much. Over to you, Captain Sashista. Uh, oh, I'll, I'll hand it over back to Captain Pradhan for the final word. Yes, uh, thank you, Captain Sashi Kumar. Uh, thank you, uh, Captain Ganendra Singh. Uh, it was a very nice uh, vote of thanks you proposed. Just thank to you. make some announcement, uh, on the 5th of November, we will be starting our uh, extra masters uh, classes again. This time it's going to be part C. So participants who are already registered can uh, um, just mark this date. Those who have not registered are welcome to do that. On the 4th of November, we will have our next uh, monthly lecture meeting like we had today. The speaker and the subject will be announced shortly. Thank you. So with you. Uh, anybody wants to make any comment, otherwise uh, we can close this meeting. Uh, as usual, I will request Captain Barve to say a few words because you are always happy to hear his voice. <laughs> Please unmute yourself, sir. <laughs> sir, we, we did ask him. We did uh, request him. Thank you very Captain much. Barve, it was sir. a very, very nice seminar. I can only say that because after all, all what I listen to is only to educate myself and not to comment on it. I thanks a lot. Pleasure, sir. Thank you. Uh, I see Captain Amar is here. Captain Halbe, sir, you're here. Where is Halbe? I haven't seen Halbe. Uh, he hasn't switched on his video. 
ਕੈਪਟਨ ਹਰਜੀਤ ਸਿੰਘ ਕੈਪਟਨ ਯੋਗੇਸ਼ ਕੈਪਟਨ ਸੁਰੇਸ਼ ਕੈਪਟਨ ਰਾਏ ਕੀ ਨਾਮ ਹੈ ਕੈਪਟਨ ਸੀ ਕੈਪਟਨ ਹਲਵੇ ਕੈਪਟਨ ਹਲਵੇ ਵੁਡ ਯੂ ਲਾਈਕ ਟੂ ਸੇ ਸਮਥਿੰਗ ਕੈਪਟਨ ਹਲਵੇ ਸਰ ਯੂ ਮਿਊਟ ਯੂ ਸਟਿਲ ਯੈਸ ਓਕੇ yes sir you can speak now are you muted again so speak for what sorry just a few <laughs> words just a few words yeah, to say hello on. to the audience <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately missed out on some part of captain patnaik's excellent uh, talk but i have heard him before and i will go miles to listen to him again uh, thank you so much uh, captain patnaik um uh, thank you so much captain halve for your kind words okay thank you captain halve thanks a lot okay i think with that uh, we can uh, close this session now thank you very much good and good night from mumbai good night good bye thank you very much thank you very much good night. thank you good, good night, night sir have good a night. great weekend good night